Hey folks, welcome to Affiliate Nerd Out. I am your nerdator Dustin Howes, spreading that good word about affiliate marketing. You're going to find me uh, here every Tuesday and Thursday at 1215 Pacific Time. So put it on the calendar and be here for my next guest. And my guest today, Joshua Kennedy. He is the founder of Imagine Marketing. And welcome to the Nerdatorium, Josh. I appreciate it, Dustin. Yeah, it's my, I'm glad to be here on the Nerdatorium. Looking forward to a conversation. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you reaching out and, and coming on board for a conversation today. And we're going to be talking about the modern affiliate manager and what that entails. And if you would like to ask me or Josh any questions out there, please jump in to the live Q&A drop a, a line in the chat. If you'd like to be in Josh's seat someday, go to dustinhouse.com slash nerd and fill out an application and a topic that you'd like to nerd out about. That's how Josh got here. He filled that out and now we're here today. So be part of that crew. Our question of the day, what other marketing disciplines are helpful for the AM role? My, my favorite pick, almost always SEO. What's your pick of the day here? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I like the like analytics side personally. So sort of data analyst kind of okay. kind of experience chops would be really useful. Um, I think a lot of it, uh, yeah, that, that'd be my recommendation. <laughs> that's super smart. That That's probably a better answer than what I said. But uh, all right. But without further ado, Joshua, who are you? That's a good question. <laughs> it depends on who you ask, but in this context, uh, definitely. So I'm the founder of Imagine Marketing. Um, so it's a company that I bootstrapped an affiliate agency primarily um, during COVID. So it was around 2020, early to 2020 that I started. Um, I've been in the affiliate space for going on about six and a half years now. Um, so I, yeah, so I've been in the affiliate, affiliate marketing space for a while. I, uh, been to a few conferences, so it's nice to kind of get to see the uh, the industry a little bit um, from that perspective. But I've been uh, in like internal at agency, so in house for agencies, in house for brands, merchants, advertisers, and then also sort of doing my own business, independent consulting, all that kind of stuff. So I'd like to think that I have a good sort of exposure to you know to the industry overall. And right now, I'm really focused on more of the entrepreneurial, building the business kind of side of, uh, of that. So. Awesome. Awesome. Six years is uh, a good amount of time in this space to really get your feet wet. Um, I'm sorry. I misspelled your name there. My mistake. We'll figure it out in uh, later on. Tell me more about Imagine Marketing. First off, what's the name origin story? How'd that get going? Yeah. So I think what it was is uh, right, right as, as I was considering had, uh, building the business, right? I was thinking about it. Okay. How do I first get the website? You know, what is what, what are the services going to look like? I uh, I kept hearing the word imagine over and over and over again oh. or seeing it places. And it just, so it was very top of mind for me at that time. You know, I, I would look at a pillow and the pillow would have imagine on it. Or I'd look up at a signpost and the sign would have imagine. So it just was really top of mind. So, uh, and two, it kind of, it, like right now, currently, I, I make music as well, and okay. I do comedy. So I do kind of think that I have a little bit of an imaginative life or a good imagination. So I think it kind of fits with my personality. But really, it was just like a super top of mind word. And I thought, hey, that's kind of a cool name. I'd like to name my my company that. So that's really the, the the origin story. Okay, so it was a sign from the universe. Uh, Imagine just popped up, and it was available as an LLC. I love it. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yes, it was. There probably what there probably like three or four variations of it, but yes, it was available as an LLC. Uh, you know, one of those hidden weird stories that that go around is naming your company something that you're going to have an uphill battle with in SEO, and we face this at Grovia when like the diaper company was just killing us and everything, uh, but. You know, imagine I, it must be with your background, you, you must be fighting that as well, I would assume. Yeah, well, I, I think a, a little bit. I think right now it's not a ton of like inbound SEO stuff in terms of like leads and all that from clients. Yeah. So I think that's probably more of like where, where I'd face difficulty. But um, and you, to be honest with you, there's not a ton of imagine, I feel like, like companies, right, that have done a super or our super top of mind, right? If you think about it, like name an imagine company. So maybe we can become that company hopefully one day. That, that'd be great. Love it. All right. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about what you do and, and who you're serving out there. 
Yeah, so I would say it's primarily an affiliate marketing agency right now. So managing affiliate programs for brands primarily, you know, we've worked in tons of verticals and or I've worked, you know, both the company and myself have worked in tons of verticals. We, we tend to see the most or tend to work the most with health and wellness CPG brands, uh, okay. like plant based protein, some CBD, some Nutra, things like that. Um, so that's primary, but we've worked in, in all kinds of verticals. Um, definitely have verticals that we prefer more than others for sure too. Um, so kind of that's the the bread and butter is affiliate marketing, but I think it's going to move toward more of a growth marketing agency too as time evolves, just because I have so much of an interest in growth marketing, data science, all that kind of stuff that we, we mentioned earlier. Um, so that's how I kind of see the company trending. So that means probably more expansion into paid ads, more CRO, things like that off the site. So kind of rounding out the services a little bit, but just because of the experience and I think kind of the core competency or core service offering will be the, the affiliate management. So, Ooh. And at this point in your career, I feel like that that's right where you should be and, and looking to expand. And, and I, I think many of the agencies out there today are doing that exact same thing. You start off affiliate and you start expanding. Like there's a lot of wasted effort that we can still utilize for PR or, or other disciplines in the marketing. So that's a really good strategy. I like that. Um, now your beginnings were a little bit different than I, than I I'm used to, uh, you started off on the content side rather than in the partnership realm or on the agency side of things. Tell me how you got started in this world. Yeah, well, I'm glad I I'm glad I shifted a little bit uh, just because that would be mainly obsolete right now if I if I would have pursued the same. <laughs> I'm just I was a writer and uh, and an English major and communications major oh. in college, so that was kind of my my entry into. Uh, I actually started working at an SEO digital services firm uh, right out of college, and then. Did some freelancing on the side, got offered a content marketing, mainly blogging content, you know, uh, for a, a group or a, um, a company that managed a portfolio of health and wellness CPG brands. Um, so I started doing content for them. And then kind of early on with, I'd say like three months into the position, four months in, I kind of saw the affiliate. I just like was doing a lot of competitor research and I saw affiliate programs everywhere. And I was like, doing, I was like, wow, this seems like something that's pretty prevalent in our space. Like maybe I should look into it. And then just kind of looked at, you know, just start, got a WordPress plugin on the website, started kind of figuring out how to do it. And uh, and then, yeah, it just became like a really big driver, revenue driver for the channel or for, for the company um, over across our, our brand. So like our primary brands, we would have like, that would be like a bulk of our revenue. And then any new brands, we kind of leverage that to tap into those partnerships, build some traffic early on, those kinds of things. So um, yeah, just was very successful then. And then that kind of became, because I was making the most money for the company at that point versus oh writing blogs and content marketing. They're like, yeah, continue doing this. Right. And uh, was in that position for about two years. We could talk a little bit about the migration of partners. Uh, if I think that's something we're going to speak about, but uh, yeah, that's basically it. So starting in content marketing, saw um, there's an opportunity for affiliate marketing based on competitor research and then just kind of went for it. Yeah. And, and that was, you mentioned a CBD company and that was in the infancy of when CBD was probably coming through and, uh, having those differentiators between your brand and the others today is like such a saturated market, but you found a, a, a nice vertical in that space for affiliate marketing to like make some success. It looks like. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. That was uh like I said, it was at that time it was probably about 40% or 50% of our revenue. Uh, oh, like, yeah. um, and you know, CBD like that was growing like that industry. Uh, those brands were growing extremely quickly back in the day. Um, so it wasn't necessarily, I mean, I would like to think that I did have some skill and, uh, you know, can, can you, or <laughs> some skill was involved, but definitely there was a lot of just right time, right place. Um, mm. but yeah. Uh, and then, but so eventually we just kind of got to a point where it was like, Hey, this is successful. There's things working, we're growing. Um, and then we migrated from that WordPress plugin then to impact radius at that point, okay. um, and which I feel like is kind of, I feel like impact has really grown a lot. For um, sure, it's just a brand, right? And, and like kind of a like as a company in terms of their vision over the past few years. But I think those are relatively early days still of like onboarding impact and, and running programs at a different financial model and things like that. So yeah, I, that was kind of what, what that role looked like. Yeah, and we will get into that migrating clients uh, portion mm -hmm. of this topic, but I want to get into the meat and bones of what we're talking about today, and that is the modernizing affiliate management strategy and what is a modern am in your opinion 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so what, what I would say is some of it is context dependent, right? Or situation dependent. So uh, some agencies might have a client run 10 accounts versus some agencies, you might be focused only on one account, right? So as an, as an account manager, that's a very different approach and strategy um, to doing that. But in terms of just general generalized affiliate management, what I think is, I think you definitely have to know the various partner types or publisher types. So, okay. um, so I think that you really need my biggest exposure to that was working in publisher development, right? Is so not only working with existing publishers or, or affiliates that are you know other clients had worked with or that were in our database, but then also kind of being on the hunt for new opportunities. Um, so I remember we you know that specifically I, I brought on a partner that had uh, you know maybe half a million a million users a month, and it was like a fitness app and things like that, or it was a fitness app, and that was not something that was in our existing library. So I think the ability to see opportunity to think outside of the box in terms of partnership recruitment, running campaigns, and not be so tied to sort of your baseline traditional publishers, I think that that's a really strong skill. Uh, the other thing is I, I really do think you need to be like data savvy, right? So you need to be able to understand. Is like think like a little bit like an entrepreneur or maybe a CEO, CMO or something like that. So it's when you're showing your data, you're not only just saying, okay, here's the CPA, like here's the, it's like, why is the, look, how does that CBA, CPA stack up or, or compare to the target CPA of the brand? How does it compare to cross channel, you know, their paid media efforts, all those kind of, could they take, you know, potentially, some dollars out of uh you know running a certain running pinterest or running snap or, or running facebook and then reinvest that into at affiliate campaigns right so i think um yeah th those are those are a couple things i'm trying to think if there's anything off the top of my head but i think definitely the data side of things and sort of having the uh, the understanding of the publisher landscape really and, and being open to new ideas new partnerships um beyond the sort of the traditional that's what i would say is super super important and a lot of times when I've like when I've inherited accounts or clients from either previous agencies or you know they however right a personal like or, or an affiliate manager is a lot of times it was just those basic partners that you'd see in, in every account and, and you know and 90 percent of accounts or something like that are the ones that just kind of apply within automatically whenever you first onboard a program so I, I would definitely yeah encourage that publisher variety for sure okay so diversification of your existing skill set really good concept uh it looks like you got a fan out there this is uh high praise from elena i don't i don't feel like she says this about a lot of people uh joshua is great alongside working with him for a while very interesting unique approaches thanks for joining in elena and being here um so continuing on that concept um you're you're talking about the modern AM and and data definitely falls in that skill set that mm -hmm. that you absolutely need. Where do you pick up these skills as an AM? Like where where's the kind of training that you that you found helpful to to figure all this out? Yeah, so I would love to say uh, that it's from an, a mentor, an individual organization. I think it's something that I collected just through time, but also too is just like an intense curiosity, entrepreneurial spirit, those kinds of things. Like, so reading um, like uh, Avinash Kashek, who is like um, basically the the data analyst for Google. Um, he he's like got a, a wonderful blog, so I would I would name drop him, and he's got. Uh, a book called Web Analytics 2.0, I believe, which I would, I would read that. So it's kind of a growth marketing, uh, it's a growth marketing book, but I think it has a lot of applications, right? So it's kind of taking, looking at what a Google Analytics dashboard report, how you can customize it, how you can interpret it, what this actually means, all those kinds of things. Um, I really do think, so specifically in our industry, uh, I think that the work that Round Barn Labs does, um, the podcast they put out, the the, the flywheel newsletter, things like that. I've always looked at them as sort of a, an inspiration or a model for the type of business that I would want to run or mm -hmm. the type of affiliate management that I would like to have, I think, because they're more like growth marketing oriented. Um, so I'd say those two things. But as far as if you're like an AM that's working internally at an agency, like you're going to have 20 other people in your same role or maybe a director or something. Each of those people is going to have a unique skill set, right? So some of them might be better communicators, other than might be more organized, better with the numbers, whatever ask internally too, right? If someone's really good with Excel reporting, analytics, like ask internally, and that could be a great way to get a start. Um, but I think, yeah, Avinash Kashik would be a, a definitely a recommendation I would have as far as like just a name to put out there. Outstanding. And, you know, I've got my 
beginnings in my career learnings from folks like Gino and uh, Sean Collins um, <clears throat> and going to affiliate summit and going to those events was, was always helpful in, in my upskilling. So, mm -hmm. um, so, but great recommendations. Uh, so in your opinion, what are AMs not doing enough of these days? You, you mentioned about how we, we can go out and upskill, but what are AMs, doing um well, what are they not doing enough these days yeah it's a good question so i think one is uh, i'm gonna flip this a little bit right so i okay. think part of it is is leadership within affiliate agencies so I, I think that a lot of times is that the account managers right at, at that level right so let's say three years of experience to five years of experience we'll just throw that out there um you're only going to know so much within that time period and you're going to be following directions from your account director your, from your vp whatever those people so i think Affiliate managers definitely have responsibility, but also internally at the organization is to understand that these account managers are just people at the end of the day with a limited bandwidth, a limited energy. So I remember when I was an account manager and doing six counts, seven accounts, trying to do six reports and presentations and slides and everything, it's it's very difficult to go deep enough with a particular client to really serve them. And I think as, as well as you can. So I think part of it is the onus and the responsibility is on the, stru the structure around um, that specific manager so i'll say that part and then as far as affiliate managers what i would do is i would challenge yourself to look into the data more deeply right and to give yeah. a more uh holistic view of understanding how the affiliate channel plugs into the entire ecosystem of a particular brand right so rather than just saying hi i'm the affiliate manager and i report on commissions and sales and, and revenue and transactions and this say so again kind of like the cpa thing i mentioned earlier is okay we know that it costs thirty dollars to acquire a customer for within a within a program. How does that how, ask them? How what are the CPAs like in your other channels? What it, how is how is Meta performing? How is what how is Google performing? Like all these different things. So understanding e-commerce from a little bit higher level perspective, I think, is really going to help you because you're also going to understand like, hey, what does this client actually care for or like care about? Right? Like, it's not yes. all metrics. Not all metrics are going to be cared the same by by brands or the, your clients. Um, and yeah, so and I would also probably on, on the back of that is to just ask questions <laughs> of the of the client that you're serving, right, is to really understand their needs and say, what's more important? Do you want revenue? Is it revenue? Is it earnings per click? Is it, you know, whatever these things are, if you can just you can ask them and they'll be very straightforward and you kind of know, OK, how do I speak to this person in a way that they're going to find the most value? Yeah. And you better ask that question in the first month of them yeah. being a client too. like find out what what they find value in and then go after that right and, but don't assume assuming is is always going to be a detriment because you might go out and spend a lot of time trying to find one type of publisher out there that they really don't care about so uh, those those things about you mentioned uh you know getting your internal team to to train you up i think one of the earliest problems that I had in my career is not understanding the product enough and then just jumping into the affiliate side. So I think there has to be some good education on what the product is, the ICP mm -hmm. and the partner potential of where we need to go and look for the those potential partners. Mm -hmm. And that's something I just didn't do enough of in my early career that I kind of learned to develop. Do you, do you feel the same way? uh yeah yes I, I well i feel like i'm always yeah for sure all, always developing um okay. and and also too i think uh like from from more like we're more on like the performance marketing side of the space but i think mm -hmm. also too is like uh yeah when you when you want to when you're engaging with a brand or a client right it's like you have to really understand that their strategy too because the affiliate program you can you can you know you can hurt hurt a brand sometimes with affiliate program. You can really ramp them up or whatever. So it's just kind of having that holistic understanding and, and really being in touch with that client and their needs. Like, is this a more long long tail, long term approach with this client? More brand awareness? Is this more of a performance marketing deal play? Like all those kinds of questions, which is coming with that alignment with the client. All right, gotcha. Um, so with your your process with your clients. Uh, are there overwhelming problems that you guys are solving when you take on these new clients? Is, is there a common theme that you see with clients? 
Yeah, what I would say is that generally speaking, if you probably ask 80%, 90%, and so obviously this is not a founded number, but if you ask most brands, what most brands are looking for when you ask for growth or you say, what do you want to do or what their affiliate brands, just let's sell more, right? So, so okay. like that's, I feel like most most clients, most brands that I, that I find, they're just looking, looking for sales or profitability. So one of the things, so what I'm trying to do is something that we've implemented is like an intake form, um, which is just like kind of get to know the founder, get to know their their goals or the CMO or whoever you're, you're you know, your day to day sort of interacting with. Um, and so I'd be happy to share that with your audience or, or like, you know, even like a written thing after our sure. conversation. But again, it kind of goes back to that, like what what are what is their knowledge of the uh, affiliates? What is what are their goals for the program? What are their goals as a brand? Uh, all that kind of stuff. So I feel like if you can mitigate sort of the uh, lack of clarity or you can make things clearer from the beginning, um, which really comes down to understanding your client, then a lot of those like sort of down the road problems, um, you can avoid those or kind of, yeah, you, can, you can avoid those a lot better if you kind of have that set of clear expectations. I think one of the most difficult things, I won't name any agencies or I think an example is uh, I've worked with like more PR content first sort of affiliate agencies. And like they would sell clients to the front end, like, oh, you're going to get this many press hits and all that kind of stuff, which I think is probably a lot of brands have probably heard that before um, if they're being pitched by affiliate agencies. But the problem is, is you're thinking is like you're really well, you're at the mercy of editors. You have to have the right product and brand. You have to have the right delivery. So it's, it's you know, one of those things where a lot of times we'd see like, OK, we're not able to deliver what was first promised. So my goal as a as a founder, as an entrepreneur, as a, an affiliate manager is to, again, like create like realistic expectations based on like based on reality, what the founder wants, then also what our deliverables can be in terms of a service. So that's kind of how I, I see that. OK, gotcha. And when you do take on these new clients, you're, uh, do you find a lot of value in migrating them from the existing platform that they're on? Like I got to assume that that you're big on like share a sale with the the clientele that you're taking on right. i think they're a fabulous uh, uh platform impact uh mm -hmm. partnerize all those are are great platforms but if you like get a, a acquire a program on a on a different platform that you're not very familiar on do, do you mm -hmm. find a lot of value migrating them over uh, yeah, I think, I think you can. And I think a lot of that comes down to a is probably the partnership. There's a, there's a few different considerations. Uh, one is probably the, the assistance of the, like the publisher development team or the, like the, the network, the agency team that you're working with. So if they're pretty high touch and easy to work with, and that's a huge advantage, what I would say is like for share sale, for instance, like their agency development team, I feel like is pretty communicative, um, maybe versus some of the other teams. So, um, that's, that's very helpful or an important consideration, obviously the technology or the functionality of the platform, right? So if you need to go more deeper analysis into the data, you may be a little bit more developed business, mature business versus just trying to start out. Um, then obviously I think the, uh, you know, looking into the fun the technical functionality, like an impactor or partnerize is maybe more important in those situations. So I think it's really about growth, growth phase, um, you know, and a lot of times what it just comes down to is cost, right? So if you, for instance, how like a billing model, if you're share sale, right? And you have an expensive product. So let's say you would sell couches and you have a, th th or, or even mattresses and you have a thousand dollar AOV, well, share sale is going to take 20% of every commission, right? So that might be yeah. more expensive than another transaction model, right? Or, or, or fee for another platform. So I would say there's probably, you know, there's probably five or six major considerations um, that you can have when you're evaluating. But I think probably most of that due diligence needs to have happen up front, which would probably be best served by talking to someone like you or like me or another agency, right, that can help you and has that experience versus just going in. Um, and then, yeah, I, so I, I think it's important up front, but it, you can absolutely migrate um, through, a, like you absolutely migrate an affiliate program while you're running it um, successfully without major hitches if done correctly too, because I've done it personally, so. Uh, I never suggest it like early on, right? It's just, mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's a big headache to migrate your, your platform, especially if you have a ton of affiliates over there. Yeah. But I mean, if it's a smaller program and you're, you're hoping to scale it in the future, do it while it's early in that program. Mm -hmm. it, sure. it, it could be the best fit for you. But 
like you said, like everything is an evaluation. You, you've got a good five points that you made like there, what you're looking for. And like, is, is the tracking dynamic enough for what you're trying to accomplish is always the biggest question and hurdle. Like if I'm going to migrate this, if I'm going to spend the time migrating these partners over, there has to be a very good reason for it. Um, and, and those are really good insights, but like if you're on a platform, like a, you know, a WordPress plugin, that's just not going to do the job for you. Um, yeah. those are going to be one of the first tasks that I do to get them on a, something that's going to help them scale. Absolutely. Um, all right. We've got a, a comment here from Victor. He says, great insight so far, Joshua curious about going about brands that you guys target to work and produce the best results. Do you guys target brands that are similar to the ones you've already have great results with? That's a good question, Victor. That is a good question. So I'll, I guess this is really a business development question. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's a complex answer. I think the where you have case studies, it's always easier to sell, right? Or, or if there, it's if you're saying, okay, we we perform mm -hmm. well in this vertical, we've done this for this client, it's always easier to have that conversation if you've serviced yeah. that vertical and perform well. So that's that's one. So yes, that's one. Um, but I think really what it really more involves is just an in-depth understanding of like what the affiliate marketing or what the affiliate industry can do. And if the brand that you're speaking to is actually going to be successful, right? So you can have a brand that wants to, wants to do affiliate, wants to get a million content placements or wants to acquire, um, grow 300% month over month or, or whatever thing is, but they're not willing to increase their commissions or they're not willing to discount their products or, or anything like that, then that's not going to be successful. So as far as like, speaking to brands and, and trying to court them and everything is uh yeah i mean i think it's i think it's important to have a realistic understanding of what verticals of, of a certain vertical like cbd is, is an example is an example right is like cbd okay. is a saturated saturated market very yes. hard to sell if a brand wants to come to you and says i want to be uh, you know grow 300 percent and I'm not willing to discount my products or invest in paid media, then you're not going to be able to do that. There's no, there's no affiliate wow. manager on, on earth can do that. So part of it is just a little bit of that experience in the affiliate industry to say, okay, like what types of clients could actually perform well? Uh, like, yeah. Like, or what, or what have I seen? What are the strategies that certain verticals or brands can use within the affiliate marketing industry in order to, to become successful so that that's a little bit harder to develop because it just takes that experience and time um so i hope that that provided some value to the <laughs> the guy asking there um wanted to give the cbd example so oh absolutely and he says thanks a lot love the response yeah. thanks victor yeah. for tuning in again and uh one other point like there also could be a conflict of interest that you have to be cautious of as well right. when you're taking on clients i mean you can't have Shopify as your client and then take on big commerce. Like it, there's right, just right. too much of a conflict of interest there. Uh, and same with a CBD, it would be tough, like taking on two CBD clients at the same time, but maybe right. you do it. Like, uh, maybe there's some variations that you could, but you want to utilize that network that you've used for other clients. That's going to be super beneficial for them. Right. Um, we got another point here from Elena. What are one, two cool opportunities you suggested in the past 12 months that are outside of the box? Hub yeah. Guys? yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I th think part of it is, so Elena uh, and I have spoken about before uh, NIFT as an opportunity, which is a, a, a gifting service. Uh, basically works like an advertising marketplace kind of in, in the back end. It's a gifting service and it helps uh, basically brand discovery. So you send out gift cards through basically uh, you send out gift cards. To, it's a, to a, a network of basically uh, a huge audience, but it's kind of, it's like a loyalty. It's kind of like a, a blend between loyalty and gifting and paid media and things like that. So that's something that we've spoken about and I've gotten like cookware brands on there. So that's something cool. interesting. It's not necessarily a, um, it's not necessarily like an affiliate, a true affiliate, partner because um, okay. they're kind of running their own advertising platform or advertising site, like yeah advertising platform basically but that's been something that we've uh that's been interesting for me and has been something to, to like i've been trying to onboard basically brands on for a long time probably okay. a year or more um and Did you say also, nift nift.com yeah go nift g-o-n-i-f-t.com cool and so another one has been 
uh, just like everything from like what Square Dance has been doing over the past year, um, a year and a half. So I first got turned on to Square Dance. And if you guys don't know, it's a, an affiliate platform that caters mainly to media buyers, but it's a growing affiliate and tech platform. They're, they're based out of Canada. Um, so they're, they're really competing with share sale and impact and all that kind of stuff, but they've got their niche in, in media buying. So that's also a really interesting new addition and development within the affiliate industry. So um, what they do is they try to basically it's more set up for funnels and driving to specific offers than just running to your website or individual product page. And what you do is you pay out media buyers um, on a CPA, similar to how you would pay, you know, a loyalty partner, a coupon partner, a content partner. Um, but their goal, they're actually going to use some of your creative, use their own ad accounts and to drive paid media traffic to specific landing pages or funnels, right? So you, there are probably one or two on there that might be able to just drive to a homepage or a category level page, but primarily landing pages. Um, so the cool thing about that is that the the golden ratio there is if you find a brand that's profitable right and a cpa that that's profitable over what the cost of acquisition is for that specific channel so it could be taboola it could be pinterest it could be it could be facebook it could be anything but as long as that customer acquisition cost so what it costs the the media buyer to like basically send that customer over and the cpa they're getting from the brand so if they're profitable there and then the brand is also making a profit margin off that CPA from what they actually, their product margin is, then that's a really good situation for all those parties and a really uh, scalable um, acquisition channels right, and affiliate partner. So Fantastic. Great, great, uh, Elena says, thank you. And then Elena, really appreciate your help. She dropped the, the links so that folks can go check out those two publications as well. Uh, man, we got questions coming in and I hate, and I want to get to some more of our topics. So um, let's, uh, let's get to one of these concepts that I, I wanted to talk about untested brands. Um, you are taking on these, uh, the brands that are coming in. And I always like to say, I want to see an e-commerce brand with a million ARR before I even consider creating an affiliate program. Do you feel in the same way? Do you think untested brands are ripe for affiliate program or where should they be spending their budget first? So I've, I've heard differences in opinion um, on this. I, I know some people in the industry say they don't like, we're not, I've heard, I've heard the tagline or the line you use, like we're not here to figure out your business. We're here to run your affiliate program essentially. So, and okay. I think, that's not quite, I think yours is a little softer than, than what that's saying. Yeah, but, that sounds uh, rude, but yeah. I get the point. <laughs> yeah, but it's, 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 it's kind of echoing the same, the same thought or the same sentiment. Uh, how I see it is if the product or brand, if the brand is viable and the product is viable, then affiliate can run you from, I can, your first dollars can be affiliate dollars. Right. So that's and, and actually I might recommend it. Right. Because if I'm if I'm an entrepreneur and I'm trying Ooh. to cut costs, um, or or mitigate risk on my end, right? I don't want to go into a paid media channel to try to build my first sales, right? Because okay. that's going to that customer acquisition cost is going to be high relative to what you can get through the affiliate channel. So I don't think it's for every brand. I think Gotbag was not. We launched their affiliate program, but we didn't like a. We'll speak to a Gotbag. It's a G O T B A G is the name of the brand. So we launched their affiliate program, um, but we weren't the very first sales for them. But they had gone into. They had started more of a paid media approach when they first started then leaned more on the affiliate stuff and that was pretty successful and that was basically from you know early revenue to where they're at today yeah. um so i guess they again to kind of uh bring that all together is i, I it's it's really hard to sell a product unless you just have a ridiculous cpa so if some uh some health and wellness products if they have a really strong lifetime value you can actually overpay the, the acquisition call like so you could pay out uh for acquisition cost or a cpa right you could say I'll pay $100 for a customer, even though you make $60 or the, the product is $60, because I know there's a three time like purchase cycle for this, this particular customer or this particular product. So there are actually brands specifically on Square Dance that overpay the, the AOV of the product just because they know they're going to get such a long time, lifetime value of it. So that, that's kind of an interesting, sure. interesting model in this. Um, but overall, it, you can't just make anything sell. It has to be a good product with real value. Uh, product like you know pr priced competitively or, or reasonably a decent website experience or else you're not going to make affiliate successful um so that that's my 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 thoughts on it but i do believe it can be the first dollars if those are dialed in okay that's fair um 
I like that concept. I, I don't think there's any problems creating an affiliate program to get rolling as you start to build that other traffic and go on down the other avenues. But one thing I find really important is finding out what Facebook ads and Google ads are costing that company. And then we take the affiliate CPA and back it out into a lead and figure out, hey, we don't need to pay that much. We can, we can get the cost per acquisition a whole lot lower than what they're doing in Facebook. But having that that baseline of what the other channels are doing is super important to like, I don't want to give too much away in the affiliate program to be like right. in all right. reality. Right. Well, you could also, then there's potential now with these like square dance is a little bit different approach, but now that you have these media buyers, you could almost turn every channel for a company into an affiliate channel. Right. Wow. So, uh, you know, cause they run Google ads, they run meta, they run all the paid media. So it's like almost all of your revenue could be paid out under an affiliate model nowadays. If you're a direct consumer brand, if you really wanted to run it that way, yeah. uh, so it's, it's interesting. Yeah. And, and is that how you're winning with got bag? Like you talked about them being early on in that space. Is, is that one of those tools that you guys are utilizing there? Um, I think I think less so because uh, I, I think less so with them. I think really what what's what's the got bag? Uh, why there was success with got bag is just because they they had limited attention to other channels actually. So like they had a smaller team that was doing a, a bit of everything, right? So they didn't have spe specialization within any particular channel. Um, so I think when we brought affiliate specialization to them and just really try to focus on building that channel, we helped them to see success. Also too, website is really nice. Brand is really cool. Story mission is really cool. So that makes it a lot easier pitch and sell to affiliates. Um, especially like around your content partners, premium content reviews, roundups, all that kind of section of affiliate marketing or that, that partner type, it makes that, those are like key ingredients to be successful there is right. Is it, what's the website look like? What are the PD, like, what are the, the media kits look like? What's the brand mission? Are there any cool founder stories? Like all that kind of stuff. So that's, we saw a lot of success on that, on that side. Beautiful. All right. We got a, a few more questions before we end up wrapping up here. Uh, Victor's got another curious what you guys use any tools to find e-commerce stores that you want to acquire as clients always interested in that um do you understand the question uh yeah i mean so what, what i would say is yeah I mean, there's a couple of different ways you can do that i think back in the day i don't do this as much anymore but you can actually find shopify directories of every single shopify store and you can um and then you can sort it by traffic right and so okay. You can you can actually look through a directory and if you really want to come up with, with like a lead list of, of clients to hit up uh, also scraping share sale like the networks for you know you can you can just do like a little data scraper and try to find all the brands on there and do it that way it's a little bit more time intensive you can do something like a sim like an SEM rush or a, or sim rush SEM rush or a similar web where you're finding organic competitors right so let's say I got bag for instance you pop got back in, you look at the organic competitors, that's going to tell you all the shared or common keywords from that specific brand to another brand. So you're likely going to find other like wandered or something like that, which is like a, another backpack brand that's kind of similar or, or a gear brand. So just doing like the organic commonality that kind of goes back to the, what you're saying is don't, don't do too much of a, there's a little bit, maybe a conflict of interest sometimes with like too common of, of brands. Uh, but that would, that maybe be another uh, suggestion for me. Another, Another way is to find, um, I've set up RSS feeds in the past where mm -hmm. you can see anyone who joins a, net, a network like immediately, right? So I know like FMTC and stuff, they have an ongoing directory of brands they have, but like you can actually set up RSS feeds where you can see every single new merchant that signs up for share sale. And so if you wanna be the first brands or the first agency, even oh. though if you, if you sign up on share sale, you're gonna get murdered with, uh, with outreach immediately from agencies, like it, it happens. Um, but that might be able to, you might be able to reach them first or just find someone that's been overlooked. So I, I would say those are a few ideas from business development, but I think overall, the best thing to do is to deliver a really good service, uh, be present within your industry and, and accept client referrals. I think that's the best way to do it. Oh, excellent. I hope you pay for those referrals there, Joshua. Be, be part of the solution. Eat your own dog food out there. I, I know. <laughs> agencies that haven't paid me for leads in the past and they're on my list of not getting the leads anymore. So don't be that guy. All right. Uh, 
<clears throat> Orlando says, uh, what's the best way to partner with mass media publishers on a performance basis? The majority of them work on a flat fee basis. Any ideas on how to integrate content reviews and listicles to your traffic mix? That's a good question. Um, so again, I think this goes back to uh, frame frame the pitch as well as you can, right? So you can only do so okay. much in your, in, in your in your control, right? But uh, things that we used to look at when we were pitching content were just like uh, like earnings per click, right? If you have a specific, if you have a specific offer, a specific product that's performing really well, like you can look at EPC because that's what the publishers are concerned with, right? At the end of the day, from a money perspective, is how much how much money are they going to make on your product or, or if someone clicks on your product, right? Or visits your website. So EPC is an important metric for publishers. Uh, another thing to consider is just like, Hey, what is, what is the audience here? Like, what are the editors? Like, what are the storytelling angles? Like, how is the editor going to approach this? Um, part writing about this particular product or this particular listicle. Um, so I think, yeah, just think about it from that perspective too. Is I, if I was writing about this product, like how would I want to share this or, or position this or frame this? You know, if, if I was writing about it, um, so key storytelling angles, how does it fit into seasonal gift guides, season big like seasonal things coming up, like you know holidays, those those kinds of things, sales days, all that kind of stuff. New product releases, is it a, is it a new product? Is there a certain customer feedback that's been provided by the product? What are the unique selling points of it? Just try to pitch it, right? So it's like how how can I differentiate myself, make this look as appealing as possible, and then relate it back to data, right? Relate it back to EPCs, the support that you're going to have for them. So that's one, right? Number two is I would say use like products or, or try to leverage uh, like LinkedIn as an example, L I N K B Y. So they're sort of a they work directly with the mass media publishers, although uh, Bonsai used to be one, but there's other multiple probably vendors and companies that do a similar thing. But so how they work it is they actually do packages based on CPC to specific media mass media partners. So if you wanted to work with a Condé Nast brand and you had a budget of five thousand or ten thousand dollars, what they would what you would do is you would sign up on LinkBee, set a certain uh, cost per click that you're willing to okay. pay. So let's say two dollars. And then you would say, okay, I would like to be in this part. I would like to be in Vogue or GQ or whatever. And I'm willing to pay $2 and this is my product. This is my brand and this is my budget for it. And so the rec what, how I've been trying to work with them is I've been trying to find the most trafficked articles that are relevant to my product or my client, right? So if you have like, a, I'll use cookware as an example. So if you have a cookware brand and there's a huge roundup about cookware sets or frying pans or that kind of stuff, I know it's going to be difficult to get from an organic perspective or to have an update of that page. You can use partners like LinkBee to say, okay, can I can I sort of get around? Is there a workaround to trying to get in the article by me guaranteeing to you a, a certain amount of you know paid investment and a certain CPC? And then if I'm looking at it from a brand's perspective, then I want to measure that CPC. Uh, and what I'm paying out as an investment versus the revenue that I'm going to get from the traffic on that article, right? So that's that's another way that you can try to do it. Um, but again, so I separate this into two categories: one, the positioning of it, um, key key selling points, all those kinds of things, and then two is use the CPC um, relationships or or companies in order to try to get to the mass media publishers. <laughs> so much there, uh, great advice, there, Joshua. If, if uh, my scribbles. Uh... Elena is out there and she can uh, document all those, those or tag all those companies that Josh is dropping down. That would be fantastic. I'll do it in post, but uh, I'm just messing around. Thanks for your help, Elena. Um, <laughs> Elena knows more than I do. so <laughs> <laughs> She does. She's so smart in this, <laughs> this arena. Uh, I love her passion for this industry. Um, all right, uh, as we wrap this up, time to, to pay some quick bills here. For those of you that are out there trying to find more affiliates, go check out affystash.com. Find more content partners that you want to be working with. Um, use the code ANO10 to save 10% there. Um, and now it's the time of the show to uh, defend your post here, sir. Um, I, I found a little post from like four years ago. Uh, it looks like a, a sincere handwritten letter that you were received. Maybe this is from a client. Maybe this is from somebody else. But I wanted, I, I love the look of this and the feel of it. And I feel like this goes a long way. And whoever wrote this handwritten letter, 
is probably very successful in our field four years later. But can you tell me like what this meant to you? Yeah. So basically what that was, it was one of my, maybe my first client, one of my first couple clients back when I founded my business. Okay. Uh, I, I can't even really remember how I, I first met them or her, her name is Iante uh, Morrow and she ran, she had a candle company. So she sold candles. And uh, I remember we just, I helped her get onboarded her first affiliate program. I started generating a few sales for her and things like that. And so she just really said, you know, thank you. She, she sent me a couple candles by, by mail and had a handwritten letter. And I believe she lived in Georgia. Um, and yeah, sent them from Georgia. Well, I don't work with her anymore. It was maybe like a six month or a year long kind of thing. But uh, yeah, that's that's the story there. But she she was very appreciative of the service that we gave her at that point in time, and it meant a lot to her. So that's that was the reason for the handwritten note. Yeah, uh, I've gotten handwritten notes in the past from companies that I've worked with or even partners, and they are still friends today. Like those things go a long way, and you don't really realize them. So every Christmas, be considering sending your top 10 people in your life something handwritten like that it's it's just going to make a friend for life absolutely uh, love absolutely. that uh, that sentiment there um looks like orlando said good feedback joshua appreciate it that was you you dropped some great nuggets of knowledge here today um so as we wrap this up how do we connect with you joshua yeah. So if you want to connect with me, obviously via LinkedIn, just Joshua Kennedy, uh, Imagine Marketing. Um, the name might, so the, the, the URL for my website is imagine-affiliate.com. So the, the website is a little bit outdated, admittedly, but we are, we are uh, shared the Figma file with you is that we're under, we'll have a, hopefully a new website within the next two to three weeks uh, up there. So I would recommend maybe revisiting it and then a month or so to see our new service offerings, new brands, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, or if you want to connect with me on social media, just uh, imagine underscore Joshua is on Instagram and I can be found there if you want to see any of my comedy skits or uh jokes or music or any of that stuff outside of just the, the business industry stuff that uh, you can check that out as well so well let me get in on that <laughs> i want to see some of this action and I'll, I'll make sure to put some comments in your in your yeah. post there uh josh really appreciate your time thanks for all the knowledge drops today um and we'll see you out there yeah appreciate it thanks dustin all right folks have a good one take care